Item number SCP-412 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-412 is currently contained within Storage Unit 11 at Site 19. Removal of the item requires authorization by no fewer than three personnel with Level 3 clearance and may be vetoed by Site Security. Gloves should be worn when handling SCP-412, and the item should be transported in an opaque container. Staff interaction must be carried out with full observance of Hazmat Protocol 7R. Any and all staff making physical contact with or direct observation of SCP-412 will submit to a full physical examination. Anyone found to exhibit physical alteration will be remanded immediately to quarantine. Description SCP-412 is an antique silver hand mirror, measuring 18 centimeters by 7 centimeters. The mirror has a 4 centimeter crack in the top left hand corner and has an etched motif of roses and vines. Around percent of subjects within direct line of sight of SCP-412 report a compulsion to pick up the item and view their reflection in it. There does not appear to be a discernible pattern to the selections. Testing for possible genetic, mental, or other selection markers is ongoing. Simultaneous observation and contact with SCP-412 causes the item to connect with the subject, regardless of whether they have been coerced into doing so by SCP-412. Tests using restrained subjects have shown that both actions, touching and viewing the reflection, are necessary for a connection to be made. No means of severing this connection have been found, short of complete isolation for a period of no less than two years. Connected subjects are compelled to repeatedly view their reflection in SCP-412, initially only once or twice a day. Viewing frequency increases over a period of several weeks. By around day 55, the amount of time subjects spend viewing their reflection typically begins to exceed all other activities, including sleep. Each viewing causes biological alterations to the subject, beginning with minor physiological changes such as enlarged lymph nodes, facial rash, or skin discoloration. Although the exact pattern differs between subjects, by day 90, almost all subjects show downward extension of the rib cage, fixed open jaw by way of large cysts towards the rear of the mouth, and severely compromised reproductive and immune systems. Subjects also show a continual loss of memory recall ability and emotional response. FMRI scans have shown a marked decrease in activity in subjects' amygdala and parietal lobes. Interviews have shown that subjects appear to have an obsession with an other for whom they are being made ready. Subjects who survive to the advanced stages of alteration begin to exhibit marked changes in behavior and more drastic physical alterations. These include the reorganization of internal organs, leading to the creation of a small empty area inside the chest, increased mucus production, and changes in hormone production and data expunged. Autopsies on advanced stage subjects have shown that the cavity could theoretically support a separate life form. This led researchers to speculate that the alterations caused by SCP-412 intend to turn the human body into an environment suit for a life form unaccustomed to Earth's atmosphere. Authorized personnel should refer to Addendum 4122 for further details. Addendum 4121 Circumstances of Retrieval SCP-412 came to the attention of the Foundation following five unexplained deaths and matching the pattern described above. Three of the deceased owned a hand mirror of a similar age. The design varied considerably. Only one mirror had reasonably intact glass. Once it had been established that the mirror was responsible for the mutations, it was taken into Foundation custody. The remains of the other two mirrors showed no unusual properties and were disposed of. Testing and observation has led researchers to theorize that SCP-412 is not the mirror itself, but is in fact an outside force 
that anchors to mirrors. This theory is unproven, but any mirrors suspected of exhibiting similar behavior must be acquired and contained. Addendum 4122 Event 412A On date expunged Subject D56653 201 days after initial connection to SCP-412 ceased viewing his reflection and sat calmly in the corner of the quarantine room. Three hours later, the subject began convulsing and clutching his chest. This continued for three minutes, after which time the subject lay immobile, apparently deceased. Once death had been confirmed, subject's corpse was taken for analysis. Pathologists found a small 8cm vaguely humanoid within the artificial chest cavity. Organism had connected to the subject's blood supply and nervous system, and had begun to extend tendrils upward, puncturing the subject's trachea. Cells in the top 5 centimeters of tendrils showed similarity to those in the optic organs of copepods, although with a much more complex structure. The origin of the organism and its cause of death are currently unknown. Item Number SCP-454 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-454 should be kept in a plastic bag with a thin piece of acid-free cardstock. This can then be contained with standard procedures and minimal security. There is no need for psychological containment. Description SCP-454 is a comic book titled The Crypt of Terror. The front cover has the picture of a female nervously looking around with a shadowy figure some distance behind her. The price is listed as 10 cents and the issue number is 17. The item bears slight damage from age and normal wear. Although the cover mentions a werewolf, the story does not. Showing a subject a photograph of the item will not trigger an attempt to obtain it. It has no unusual physical or mental effects on subjects who have seen no more than pages of the interior. Such subjects experience a mild desire to read the item, but it is no greater than that provoked by any other interesting item. The interior story of the comic, as far as researchers are able to deduce, concerns a woman being stalked by a mysterious force. Julia the protagonist refers to the force only as him. Much of the story concerns Julia's efforts to escape him. She finally believes that she has bested it, only for it to data expunged. The first and last pages also bear a number of advertisements normal for 1950s era comics, which do not display the item's primary effect. If a subject who shows normal levels of empathy begins to read the comic, they will become more and more interested in it, expressing fear and relief as the story progresses, and finally horror when it ends. Subject's psychological state descends into excessive denial and depression as the story ends. After reading the comic, subjects begin to think and talk solely about a need to save Julia from him. If given time alone and appropriate materials, Subjects write or draw continuations of the story in an effort to provide a continuation where Julia survives. Each of these efforts will end with Julia dead as before, however. In the event that a subject should make Julia survive, through deus ex machina or similar plot devices, they will throw away their effort, saying that it does not fit into the story. These efforts come to occupy a great deal of the subject's time and effort percent of subjects suffer from severe depression, becoming withdrawn and uncommunicative. Higher than normal rates of suicide have been observed. Interviews with subjects and study of notes left behind show a sense of helplessness and of having failed Julia. Subjects with a history of data expunged undergo an additional event. The subject will write themselves into the story, claiming to have found the perfect way to save Julia personally. Approximately percent of such subjects are subsequently found data expunged. Misogynistic or low empathy subjects display no psychological effect and show no interest in the comic or the characters after reading. Addendum In a recent experiment, D-class personnel with normal levels of empathy were instructed to read the comic and placed in isolation. After multiple attempts, 
One subject claimed to have found a way to save Julia. He was found dead with data expunged. The security camera in his room suffered electrical disturbances during the event, in which a figure was seen briefly standing in the room. No signs of entry were seen. The security team was placed on probation. Item Number SCP-508 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-508 requires no special containment procedures, so long as it is kept out of direct view of any SCP staff. At least 1% of SCP-508 must remain covered, except when actively being tested. It is currently kept in a small closet, with no windows or ventilation. The door is to be kept securely locked at all times. If SCP-508 is to be tested, it may be sealed in an opaque container and transported to any environmentally sealed testing room available. Due to the potential risk resulting from its secondary effect, the room is to be sealed using positive pressure and sanitized using when the test is complete. Unless there is a strong need to preserve the test subject, they also should be sanitized using in the event that the subject must be retained. They should be held in quarantine for a period of no less than days. Description SCP-508 appears to be a random dot stereogram poster of dimensions 255 by 197 centimeters. Caution must be taken when interacting with it, as even a cursory glance may fascinate the viewer, giving them an overwhelming desire to properly view the hidden image. Viewing the image appears to only be possible when the viewer stands one meter in front of the image and stares directly at it. Attempts to view the image via mirrors or having multiple subjects attempt to view it have failed, with only the properly positioned subject able to see the image. In testing, achieving proper focus to be able to view the image has taken an average of 93 seconds. Subjects exposed multiple times appear to view it more quickly, but never in less than 60 seconds. Once the viewer has achieved proper focus, the poster seems to function as a window to some other location. Effect 1. These locations range from the banal, e.g., a view of the same room but from the perspective of a different wall, to surreal and potentially maddening. In addition, the window appears to function bi-directionally, exposing the viewer to the gaze of whatever is being viewed. Regardless of the time required for the viewer to acclimate to the needed focus for the image, after the same amount of time has passed with the user viewing through the window, the interface appears to undergo a secondary change, effect 2, and becomes permeable, although only to the viewer and the viewed subject or area. The requirement for viewing appears to extend to the secondary effect, even in the case of event where the subject was dismembered and pulled through the image. Two other subjects in the test room were unaffected. Addendum. Photographs, scans, and copies of SCP-508 do not inherit its primary properties, as the user is unable to see more than a strangely compelling blur. All such copies should be kept filed away, and no personnel shall view them for more than minutes in any given hour period, as extensive viewing has been shown to induce an overwhelming desire to see the original. Effect 3. If the subject is unable to see more than percent of the image, due to it being partially covered, obscured, etc., neither effect is demonstrated. Copies of SCP-508 show the same limitation with regards to Effect 3. Addendum Careful removal of the backing material revealed a price sticker, indicating SCP-508 was sold for $14.98. No indication of the store from which it was sold was found nor was the UPC code able to be matched to any known database. Test Logs Experiment 1 Male subject D-9211 was exposed to SCP-508 and told to make note of any image perceived. After 93 seconds, subject began to giggle. When asked to explain, subject blushed and stated, Oh, nothing? I just… nothing really. Just a funny view. Later interrogation revealed SCP-508 to have provided a view into a women's changing room at a local department store. Subject terminated 0710-1623 hours due to unreliability. Experiment 2 
Male subject D4599 was placed in a chair in front of SCP-508, without instruction. The subject was seen to glance at SCP-508 momentarily, look around, then return to observing it with a perplexed expression on his face. After 102 seconds, subject appeared to enter a state of extreme agitation, sweating profusely, and attempting to draw back from SCP-508 without leaving the chair. After an additional 102 seconds, subject suddenly became very pale and attempted to leave the chair. After moving less than 12 inches, subject screamed and collapsed to the floor. Examination of subject revealed an 11 centimeter cylindrical segment missing from the left side of the subject's abdomen. The edges of the wound appeared to be cauterized. Autopsy revealed that death occurred due to severe systemic shock. Experiment 3 Male subjects D8788 and D7422 placed in test chamber with SCP-508 and instructed that the first to identify the image would win a prize. After several minutes of vying for position, the subjects both began to scrutinize the poster. After 87 seconds, D7422 suddenly turned his head away in disgust. Inquiries as to what had become visible were not responded to, and subject was remotely terminated. D-8788 was advised to resume the test, on pain of suffering the same disposal. After 92 seconds, D-8788 suddenly smiled and moved closer to SCP-508, before tapping on its surface. Subject appeared surprised to find a solid surface, but continued to observe. After an additional 87 seconds, the subject was seen to lift his head and sniff, then suddenly dive at SCP-508 passing through its surface with no resistance. Subject D-8788 has yet to be located. Experiment 4 Male subject D-4431 and female subject D-6744 placed in test chamber with SCP-508 after being shown footage of Experiment 2. Both subjects sat on the floor facing away from SCP-508 and began to talk. After several minutes, D-6744 shook her head in response to a comment made by D-4431 and inadvertently allowed her gaze to rest upon SCP-508 for less than one second. Although visibly shaken, she looked back at it repeatedly for the next ten seconds, before changing position to obtain a better view. Repeated warnings from D-4431 failed to dissuade D-6744 from attempting to view the image. After 103 seconds, D-6744 suddenly blanched and began to vomit. Subjects were then removed and interrogated. Subject D-6744 was unable to describe what she had seen, stating that it was somehow wrong, but in a way she could not explain. Subject D-4431 admitted to looking at SCP-508 after seeing D-6744's response, but claimed to have seen nothing. Subjects quarantined for potential future testing. Experiment 5 Female subject D-9801 instructed to enter test chamber, observe SCP-508, and report back. After 93 seconds of observation, the subject was heard to exclaim, Oh, that's neat! Interrogation revealed subject to have seen an image of herself in what she thought was some kind of experimental mirror. Subject also noted that the image was not reversed from left to right as would be the case in a conventional mirror. Subject quarantined to be used for future tests. Experiment 6 Male subject D-6621 shown video of Experiment 5 and instructed to enter test chamber, observe SCP-508, and report back. After 97 seconds, subject D-6621 made sounds indicative of disgust and stated, Ew! They can't make it in here, can they? After an additional 97 seconds, D-6621 suddenly demanded to be let out and moved to the farthest point in the test chamber from SCP-508. After 43 seconds of the subject becoming increasingly agitated and demanding to be let out, the subject suddenly began to scream and swat at his legs. Analysis of the video log shows that the subject's legs appeared to be being bitten by a large number of small creatures. Based on concurrent wounds, at least 27 bites were being inflicted at any one time. After 14 seconds, 
the subject collapsed, whereupon the subject began taking wounds over his entire body. After an additional 14 seconds, the subject lost consciousness. Within seconds of the subject being rendered unconscious, all damage ceased. Subject was unable to be returned to consciousness and was terminated 2110 0217 hours. Autopsy revealed the bites to be consistent with those of unusually large bed bugs, with traces of a neurotoxin found within the wounds. Experiment 7 Repeat female subject D9801 instructed to enter test chamber, observe SCP-508, and report back. After 81 seconds of observation, the subject was seen to turn about several times and state, Oh, well, that's… different. Interrogation revealed subject to have seen an image of herself as seen from behind. Upon turning around, subject saw what appeared to be an identical copy of SCP-508 behind her. No such object appears on the video log. Subject quarantined to be used for future repeat tests. Experiment 8 Male subject D-2232 placed in test chamber and told that he would be rewarded if he could properly identify the object shown by SCP-508. Subject had been fitted with a remote activation tranquilizer collar to test the effect loss of vision through unconsciousness would have on effect 2. After 87 seconds, subject leaned forward and stated, Wow, I didn't know these could show live images. Who is that? Subject was advised to continue observing. After an additional 87 seconds, the subject made a come here gesture towards SCP-508. Six seconds later, video surveillance shows SCP-507 climbing out SCP-508's frame. 507 indicated appreciation at being retrieved, as his most recent shift had interrupted his lunch. SCP-507 was permitted to return to his normal routine. Subject D-2232 terminated, due to security risk. 2910, 0427 hours. Tranquilizer collar recovered for future testing. Item number, SCP-544. Object class, Euclid. Class updated after event 544-423245. By order of 05... Special Containment Procedures When not in use, SCP-544 is to be kept in a standard 1 meter by 1 meter by 1 meter locked storage container. When in use, the bearer of SCP-544 is to be under visual and auditory surveillance at all times. In the event that SCP-544 is to be removed from a bearer, it is to be only done by legally deaf staff in Auditory Safe Room number 524264. Description SCP-544 is a 30 centimeter tall handheld radio microphone made of polished metal and black plastic. There is no evidence of wires or electrical plugs of any kind on the object. The object's surface reveals significant but superficial damage, presumably from everyday use. When jostled, the sound of a non-metallic object can be heard inside the device. Requests to disassemble SCP-544 to identify this object have been denied. When grasped by the neck of the microphone, the bearer will gain a subtle but significant compulsion to keep SCP-544 in his or her possession at all times. This compulsion begins as a simple dislike for the idea of letting go of SCP-544, but inevitably culminates in a desire to keep SCP-544 in a pocket or other carrying method at all times. Attempts to retrieve SCP-544 when the bearer is asleep have generally resulted in separation events. See below. After two days of bearing SCP-544, it will begin to speak for its bearer, through methods unknown. The sound SCP-544 makes is identical to the bearer's original voice, and the bearer does not seem to notice that this voice replacement is occurring until explained. As time passes, more and more of the subject's speech is replaced by SCP-544, and the vocal tone of SCP-544 becomes much more electronic, with a comical and jovial tone. Within two weeks, the bearer is completely voiced by SCP-544. Attempts to remove SCP-544 from the bearer's possession 
result in what has been dubbed a separation event. SCP-544 will produce a screeching tone in order to incapacitate those that wish to gain SCP-544. The decibel levels of separation events have ranged from 140 to 150 decibels, causing significant discomfort and pain. The original bearer of SCP-544 is somewhat affected, but to a severely lesser degree. Incapacitating the bearer before attempting to acquire SCP-544 causes the same separation event. After the event, its original bearer recovers normally, with the exception of being unable to speak at all. Autopsy of bearer's brains revealed near-complete atrophy of posterior inferior frontal gyrus section, commonly known as Broca's area. Because of the risk to personnel nearby when separation events occur, O5 has ordered that all operations done to retrieve SCP-544 are to be done in auditory safe rooms, ASRs, rooms specifically designed to mitigate and reduce sound-related issues. Addendum 1 – Interview with SCP-544 Bearing Subject Interview Date 04-12-2000 Interviewer Researcher Subject D-7899 Current amount of time subject has born SCP-544. One week, two days. Please note, by this time, a significant percentage of D-7899's vocalizations come from SCP-544. In the interest of clarity, sections in which SCP-544 is speaking will be written like this, in keeping with SCP-544's higher electronic voice. As is standard with this effect upon its bearers, D-7899 does not notice, or does not seem to care, when he stops using his mouth to stop in the middle of a sentence. Researcher, and how are we today, 7899? I see you've taken to stuffing SCP-544 into your pocket. D-7899, yes, it was getting a bit annoying having to hold this thing in my hands. Plus, it fits pretty well, don't you think? Researcher, true, but have you considered returning it to us? What are you using it for? D-7899, shrugs, nah, why would I want to give this up? I like it. Believe it or not, most of the other D-class folks think I'm higher up on the food chain because I've got this thing. Stupid gangbanging racial insults. They think owning an old-time radio microphone is some version of a gang sign. Would you believe that they occasionally try to take the expletive thing when I'm sleeping? Expletive and racial insults. Have they forgotten that they're in friggin' jail? <laughs> this isn't Detroit for God's sake. Researcher, let's refrain from racial insults, 7899, and mind your tone. You're in jail with them too. Tell me more about what happens when they try to take it from you. D7899. Fine, fine, sorry about the cursor. Anyways, I'm a light sleeper, so the minute I feel their dirty little mitts unzipping my pocket, I'm awake. Then the metal noise starts up, and they start clutching their heads like it's a bullhorn. They back off, and I go back to sleep. Researcher, metal noise? D-7899, you know, that noise it makes when someone tries to take it. You guys installed it, right, so that nobody steals it from me? Uh, what was that uh, stupid horn those Africans played at soccer games so much that everyone hated? Um, like that, but more synthetic. A lot quieter, too. Have to give you boys credit. It's a perfect stop touching my expletive alarm sound. Winces. Sorry, sorry, I know. Don't swear. Force of habit. Researcher. Ah, yes, that metal noise. We made that noise for military discouragement operations. What would you say if I told you that you keep alternating between speaking with your voice and that microphone speaking for you? D-7899. I'd laugh at you, because you guys tried that trick a few days after you gave me this thing. You guys told me to randomly talk while looking into what you guys said was a mirror. Of course, it wasn't a mirror, since I stopped talking a few times in the does air quotes. Reflection. While I kept talking. Freaked me out a bit, but then I realized you guys just recorded me standing somewhere, doing nothing, 
and use that fancy CGI expletive to make it look like I wasn't talking a few words. Nice try, Doc. Addendum 2. Event 544 Alpha. On 05-24-2000, at 3.42 a.m., the current bearer of SCP-544, D-423245, was asleep in his bunk. While undisturbed and remaining asleep, SCP-544 began to speak seemingly random phrases. It was initially assumed that D-423245 was simply talking in his sleep until SCP-544 began speaking things which could not have possibly been dream-based. Later bearers of SCP-544 repeated many of the following lines in their sleep. For a full listing, please see file 544.fullog.353. I was slumbering. I was waking. Flames. Fire. Burning. I slumbered again. There is no... There is no... There is no barrier. The slab groans. I groan to match. We rise together. When? 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 I dreamed until the dawn, but then it was not dawn. It was false. Dawn that was not a dawn. Dreams turned to dust. The number was expunged. The number is expunged. No, not time. Not yet. No. Wait and dream. Wait and dream. Event 544 Alpha and later similar situations has caused the Foundation to reevaluate SCP-544's nature. It is currently not understood how SCP-544 or its multiple bearers have a knowledge of SCP, much less how SCP has anything in common with SCP-544. More startling is 544's mentioning of the specific latitude longitude of Foundation Overwatch. In response to event 544-423245, SCP-544 has been upgraded to Euclid status. Addendum 2, event 544-beta. On 09-15-2000, at 4.01 a.m., the current bearer of SCP-544, D-6434-9, was seen walking around the medical cell he had been contained in due to a common illness. Conversation with D-6434-9, speaking through SCP-544, began shortly thereafter. To date, there have been attempts to forcibly recreate the events of 544-beta with no success. Doctor, up and about 64349, feeling better? D-6434-9, long pause, buried. Doctor, excuse me? D-6434-9, unintelligible. Doctor, please repeat yourself. D-6434-9, long pauses between words begin here and continue throughout the conversation. Perversion. Corruption of the method. I am trod under those who exist to serve me. Doctor realizes he's not talking with D-6434-9. What method are you speaking of? Does the person I'm talking to exist to serve you? D-6434-9. Touch the stone. Become my voice. Speak my truths and my rules to the people. I warned them. Popocate Petal was the warning. Warning of corruption. Arrival. Destruction. Note. Popocate Petal is a volcano located in Mexico. Doctor, what happened? D-6434-9. Extremely long pause. My voice was not protected. Pretenders to my glory usurped me. Shattered. Disregarded. I slept. Doctor, and what caused you to wake up? Do you remember when? D-6434-9. Shakes head. Shard of me. Not enough. The cerdos. Treated like. Unknown. Translations suggest bearer of wooden collar. 
Blasphemy. Touch the stone. Become my voice. Touched the stone. Spoke for them. Rapidly. Alternating between Nahuatl, Spanish, and English. Arrogance. 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 At this point, D-6434-9 awoke, presumably by the sound of SCP-544. He turns to face Dr. who startles him. D-6434-9. Jesus wept, Doctor. Do you get your jollies off watching patients get up to take a piss? Doctor, none of your business, D. Good night. Item number, SCP-571. Object Class, Keter. Special Containment Procedures. A single piece of paper containing an instance of SCP-571 should be kept inside an opaque sealed container of any kind, at the center of any high security containment room. Currently, the primary containment chamber at Compound 1043, Site 143. This containment room must be equipped with incineration devices, which shall be maintained and tested regularly. Any site housing SCP-571 must not be located within 200 kilometers of any minor population center, or within 500 kilometers of any major population center. No devices that have any capability of transmitting pictures are to be allowed within the perimeter of the compound housing SCP-571. Only one instance of SCP-571 should exist at any time, except during specially approved testing. Should the paper containing SCP-571 be destroyed, another copy may be printed from the encrypted backup file. No other recordings of SCP-571 are to exist. SCP-571's containment chamber is to be monitored using infrared devices. Eight Level 2 guards must be stationed outside of SCP-571's containment chamber at all times. Four of these guards are to wear infrared goggles during shifts. Any persons attempting to enter the containment chamber without authorization are to be terminated immediately. Upon any successful unauthorized entry, the incineration devices in SCP-571's containment chamber are to be activated immediately. All personnel leaving Site-143 are to be examined for potential SCP-571 contamination without visual contact, as outlined by Protocol 571-Alpha. Personnel attempting to bypass Site-143 security are to be terminated within Compound 1043's 10-mile perimeter. In the case of an SCP-571 containment breach, affected personnel are to be summarily killed and incinerated. If Compound 1043 becomes significantly compromised, the network of auxiliary incineration devices should be activated, as outlined by Protocol 571-Alpha. Mobile Task Force Eta-10 see no evil, are assigned to handling potential instances of SCP-571 and SCP-571-related memes appearing independently outside containment. Description SCP-571 is a complex pattern of lines and scribbles with an anomalous mimetic effect. Appearance was determined by cutting an image of 571 into sections and rearranging the sections disabling the pattern's anomalous effect and allowing it to be safely viewed. SCP-571's anomalous effect has changed since its initial containment by the Foundation. The mechanism, if any, that has caused the changes in this effect, or its initial creation, is unclear. See documentation attached. Current SCP-571 anomalous effect follows. When any human looks at SCP-571 for any amount of time, they will immediately search for a piece of paper or other suitable stationery. The exposed human will then begin to copy SCP-571 onto the new paper with any available drawing implement. Despite the particularly high complexity of the pattern, copying of SCP-571 by an exposed human will be successful approximately 96% of the time. Once SCP-571 has been copied, whether successfully or not, the affected person will seek out other humans and attempt to coax or force them to view the copied pattern. Successfully infected victims will immediately attempt to copy the pattern, thus continuing the process. 
attempts to reason with infected persons are met with failure. Carriers of SCP-571 will typically only talk or interact with others for the eventual purpose of causing them to look at SCP-571. Initially, SCP-571 carriers retain their original personality and behavior, with the added compulsion aspect, similar to a heightened obsessive-compulsive disorder. In this stage, carriers can often be communicated with as normal, but are unable to prevent themselves from acting out the SCP-571 compulsion. If an individual SCP-571 carrier does not successfully infect a new, previously uninfected carrier within exponential psychological deterioration will occur in the carrier. The type and rate of deterioration varies from carrier to carrier, but ends with near total lack of activity in the cerebrum. Onset of deterioration can be delayed further, or temporarily halted once begun, by infecting multiple new carriers within a short period of time. Individual SCP-571 carriers are aware of this circumstance, and may use this fact as a way to coax others to view the SCP-571 pattern. Carriers of SCP-571 who are unable to locate other uninfected humans for days will begin to regularly coax other carriers to view and copy the pattern again. In the final stage of psychological deterioration, 30% of carriers will, if not prompted otherwise, continue this cycle until undergoing death by thirst. The remainder of exposed individuals will eat and drink as necessary, but will often neglect other non-vital bodily needs, such as using restrooms or voluntarily sleeping. Exposure to Class C amnestics may cause SCP-571 carriers to lose their ability to perfectly duplicate the SCP-571 pattern. However, carriers will continue to attempt to recreate the pattern and attempt to coax other individuals to view it. These depictions are never accurate depictions of SCP-571, even in individuals with photographic memory, as the pattern is too complex to be copied by non-anomalous means and cannot be transmitted. There is no known means of completely curing individuals affected by SCP-571. As carriers of SCP-571 are permanently unable to engage in any conscious activity unrelated to enticing another person to view SCP-571, containment breach may result in an AK-class end-of-the-world scenario if SCP-571 carriers are able to reach major urban population centers. Addendum Incident X-571-A Data expunged because of the heightened likelihood that further instances may come into existence outside of containment, SCP-571 has been reclassified as Keter. Description and containment procedures updated accordingly. Additionally, it appears that in the event of an SCP-571 critical mass carrier population, defined as a population above within close proximity to one another, the psychological deterioration effect can be staved off indefinitely. However, the compulsion aspect remains permanent. Item Number SCP-572 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-572 may be safely kept in a locked safe deposit box at Site-19's High Value Item Storage Facility. Standard Positive Action Defenses Explosive Chemical Biological and Mimetic are to be in place at all times, according to standard operating procedure. As there is no possible reason for SCP-572 to be used in the field, the item is to be kept more as a curiosity than for any scientific purpose. Description SCP-572 is a sword manufactured by The weapon is badly balanced for combat use, is made of substandard steel, and does not hold an effective combat edge. However, the weapon has the unusual psychotropic quality of convincing anyone who holds it of its balance and cutting power, as well as conferring feelings of great strength and invincibility. This effect cannot be countered by any known means, and the affected subject will continue to maintain these beliefs so long as they hold the blade. Subjects will be compelled to perform dangerous stunts using SCP-572, including but not limited to Attempting to cut a moving car in half, slicing through a bullet fired from a rifle, cutting through another sword, and 
engaging in a live steel duel with a trained period swordsman. Because of the prevalence of unnecessary cutting edges, 75% of such attempts end with serious injury being inflicted upon the user. Should the sword be successfully wrested away from an affected subject, preferably using long-handled tongs to prevent the retriever from being affected, all psychological effects can usually be expunged by a single swift blow to the back of the subject's head. Addendum SCP-572 was retrieved from the home of a Upon being apprehended for violent, drunken, and disorderly behavior, Mr. attempted to charge the arresting officers while brandishing SCP-572, screaming that he would, quote, take their heads, and with it, their power, end quote. As Mr. was overweight and badly out of shape, officers successfully pacified him using tasers and flexible baton beanbag rounds fired from a 12-gauge shotgun. Upon retrieving the weapon, Officer was heard muttering about the effectiveness of SCP-572, claiming that if Mr. had managed to score a hit, one of the officers would have lost a limb. This despite the fact that the weapon had an edge blunter than a butter knife. An SCP deep cover operative assigned to the precinct discovered SCP-572's unusual properties and retrieved it from evidence storage. An identical weapon from the original manufacturer was procured as a replacement. As of the writing of this article, no further weapons from the same manufacturer have shown any anomalous properties. Item Number SCP-581 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures Except for approved testing, SCP-581 must be kept a minimum of 1,000 meters from all members of all equine species. SCP-581 is to be kept in locked, climate-controlled facilities. No firearms are allowed in proximity to any examples of SCP-581-2. Description SCP-581 is a horse's nose bag, made from leather. Any equine subjects, horses, mules, and donkeys have all been confirmed to be susceptible. Zebras, Onagers and other non-domesticated hybrids have not been tested due to budgetary reasons. Within 500 meters is potentially an instance of SCP-581-1. SCP-581-1's sole motivation appears to be inserting its muzzle within SCP-581. This is strong enough to override instinctual reactions to predator urine or females in heat and has caused instances of SCP-581-1 to harm themselves in the process of attempting to free SCP-581 from within steel safes. Only one instance of SCP-581-1 is known to exist at any time. Examples of SCP-581-1 will actively resist being removed from SCP-581's range of effect, and will sicken and 90% die within a week of SCP-581 being forcibly removed. If SCP-581-1 succeeds in inserting its muzzle within SCP-581, it will become an example of SCP-581-2. SCP-581-2 is an equine characterized by several anomalous behaviors. These behaviors seem to indicate that SCP-581-2 believes itself to be a human. Observed anomalous human-like behaviors include Attempts to walk on its hind legs Attempts to attack its head with its front hooves. Attempts to enter the driver's seat of unoccupied vehicles. Fascination by, and then hostility towards, reflective surfaces. Attempts to clasp firearms with its front hooves. Extended periods of aberrant modulated vocalizations. These are believed to be SCP-5812's attempts to speak. Data expunged. To date, all specimens of SCP-5812 have been euthanized due to multiple limb fractures. No specimen has survived longer than two hours. Item Number SCP-597 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-597 is to be guarded and researched by a rotating monthly shift. 
Those in charge of the design of the containment procedures are not allowed contact with the SCP. If at all possible, this duty should be left to overseer-level personnel. No one is to be allowed to view, on video or through a window, or be in the same room as SCP-597 for longer than five hours. Maintenance personnel are to alternate every day. Evaluations are to be given at the end of the shift, or whenever mental distress seems obvious. If psychological contamination is too great and poses a tangible danger, termination can be performed immediately by the on-site analyst. The mental health offices are soundproofed for this purpose. The doctor can terminate up to ten individuals at a time. Any more requires the approval of an overseer. In this scenario, Procedure 59732, weaning the babies, is to be activated. Vents in the ceiling require regular maintenance for this purpose. Smoke detectors are not to be turned off for any reason. Candles and incense lit in 597's cell are to be taken as an indication of a dangerous obsession. The leaving and offering of food, as 597 does not require it, is to be viewed in the same light as well. All other signs of unnatural love and religious awe are to be reported along with these. The room and the surrounding area are to be sealed with ventilation shafts, plumbing, and wiring checked daily. Measures are to be put into place for the continuous extermination of all vermin in the facility. Animals not part of the study found suckling on SCP-597 are to be removed and terminated as soon as possible due to risk of biological contamination. Because of this, in the morning, workers must wear hazmat suits while entering the cell, for SCP-597 is often covered in vermin, including mice, opossums, squirrels, and bats. 597 is to be hosed down weekly, with special care given to the areas around the nipples to prevent the buildup of saliva and drool. Those suckling need washing daily, as does the floor underneath them, for the removal of the puddles of urine, feces, for the first few days. But when solids completely leave the body, this is no longer necessary, although occasionally a thin watery substance is excreted, and vomit, which is produced when they drink too eagerly, quickly, or out of rhythm. The cleaning products are to be plain and unscented. Use of aromatics or herbal oils will be noted and no scrubbing is to be done by hand. Description SCP-597 is a blob of flesh, approximately 5.8 meters, or 19 feet, high, and 10.67 meters, or 35 feet wide, although this measurement changes slightly when it moves, or the substances expand and ripple. All over its body, mostly located on its rolls, are hundreds and hundreds of teats of various colors and sizes. Whenever a mammal is released into its cell, it will be drawn to the corresponding teat for its species and then proceed to suckle as long as they are unimpeded. The milk released will be identical in every way to the makeup of the subject's mothers, although able to sustain the subject's nutritional needs indefinitely. While the fluid is the same as normal milk chemically, for some reason, whether it be an effect of the SCP or an unknown quality of the substances it excretes, any full-grown mammal that would normally require more can survive to the end of their normal lifespan, give or take a few years, simply by suckling at the nipple, although their teeth will fall out. Their muscle will atrophy due to lack of use. The subjects will curl up as close as possible on the side, lay under the SCP. There have been reports of suffocation or immerse themselves and dive into the flesh itself, and stomach problems are presented because of the all-liquid diet. Milk taken in a bottle does not have the same results, although those already affected by SCP-597 will fall under a quasi-hypnotic hold when presented with a container, will do anything to possess it, and find drinking it very gratifying. Those in charge of bottling the liquid have the urge to use a rubber teat for feeding babies as a cover, even when a normal lid will suffice, and will attempt to do so even when informed that it is in violation of dangerous materials protocol, not being an airtight seal. The urge to suckle is a mental, 
physical and sexual compulsion. While lower life forms cannot resist its effects at all, humans can, although they experience great difficulty. Those in SCP-597's presence describe it as a mental pull, leading us to the conclusion that it is partially telepathic, although it is also obviously appeals to deep instincts, and is hormonal as well. Endorphins associated with breastfeeding and maternal comfort are released. Those who do give in do so in a mad rush, all restraint broken at once, or a slow ritual, commonly involving bowing, kneeling, crawling, and chanting. They are reduced quickly to an infantile state, and within one hour, lose all linguistic abilities, intellectual capabilities, and willpower. Before complete loss of brain function, it is said to be highly comforting and pleasurable, and they say they feel safe, quote, like never before, end quote. Before and after contact is made, there are reports of strong feelings associated with vague images and recollections and sensations, all traced back to the womb or crib, often centered around remembrance of their parents' smell and facial appearance. Data expunged. Retarded blind data expunged. Permanently attached. Data expunged. Data expunged. Those who watch are also influenced, although in lesser or different ways. Increased pettiness. Regression to childish states. Extreme immaturity. Decreased bowel control. Fetishization. Promiscuity and even reports of public masturbation have all been noted. Staff's IQ, focus, and rationality all drop significantly over a period of time with SCP-597, and they often will fight with each other over silly things, such as objects or perceived insults, be racked with laughing and crying fits, be unable to resolve problems in an adult way, and lose the ability to control their emotions. After four to five weeks, it is impossible for them to function in a work setting, and they all communicate with each other with a series of grunts, coos, and short, confused sentences. Attention should also be paid to the fact that the employee's name for the object degenerates from the official title, SCP-597, to the mother, then to just mother, then mom, mommy, mum, and so forth often ending in sucking, blowing, or kissing sounds as the representation. Also of interest is that almost immediately strong oral fixations will develop or resurface. Those who quit smoking will start again, 100% occurrence, and the chewing of gum, snacking, gluttony, nail and lip biting, and hair chewing rises as well, almost to the point of psychosis. There are deadly weight gains, choking incidents, balls or clumps of human material obstructing the digestive system, murders over food, the vending machine is often completely empty, and dental and health problems. Doctors and personnel in the area of effect, even those entering for a few moments, will find themselves absent-mindedly putting something in their mouth without realizing it. Observation of the employees in their homes or private lives also reveals data expunged, often to the point of only being aroused by data expunged. Men with already unstable or fragile egos find a strengthening in oedipal complexes, often to dangerous levels. Three employees have raped and murdered data expunged. These same personality types also enjoy data expunged and request access to SCP-597 for that purpose. Unfortunately, although this behavior is not encouraged, those with this disease are many, too many to take a moral or ideological stance, and completely restrict the activity without losing the needed number of workers. A good number are also high-level personnel, although revelation of their identity is forbidden, and requires clearing the area and disabling the camera feed so they can perform the act, which is not allowed to go over an hour, or separation will cause seizures and homicidal tantrums. Specific procedures for sexual visits can be found in Document 597-XD-12. Addendum 1 
Document 597XX23. Found currently at 597's base and sides are 61 specimen suckling. They are... Four dogs at its bottom area, laying out in front of it like a litter. Six cats. Twenty-seven rats hanging off its front. The wild vermin swarms that often hoard around it are especially problematic. But these are all lab-bred, except for SCP-597 SS-19 and SCP-597 SS-24, which refuse to be removed and are clamped too tightly on just to pull off. Fifteen bats that cover approximately all of its back, their wings flapping spasmodically, creating a slight gust. Eight humans, four D-Class personnel, three doctors, one guard. Addendum 2. Document 597XD12. Data expunged. Data expunged. Data expunged. Care must be taken not to allow them to attempt to rip or tear a hole in 597 for penetration purposes. Data expunged. Addendum 3. Document 597XX25. An all-female task force has been shown not to be more effective in containment, as demonstrated by three events. The development of bisexual tendencies in Data Expunged. The loss of five female guards who after writing Mommy, Mommy, How I Love My Mommy all over the walls of the cell were lost and began suckling and the suicide of Dr. Vanison, who after circling each and every teat in red sharpie marker and writing life next to them, shot herself in the head. Addendum 4. Document 597XYC13. Data expunged. Data expunged. Inside the temple, the SCP was found, surrounded by scaffolding and staircases, with ladders propped up against the meat to allow as many people as possible to partake in the event. Data expunged. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.